session. thin line demarking the sane from the insane, a line over which many stumble while groping from the ever-elusive shadows of a mad obsession. Fears, hates, jealousies, loves, these are all kindred things of human emotion, as we are about to prove in this story starring Philip Terry, the story of a man who crossed the line from whence there is no returning in his mad flight to escape the horrors of his own obsession. Lucid moments in the tortured life of Norton Roberts. Times when the brilliant glare of reality stabs through the haze of his mist-enveloped mind. And during these times, he has but one desire. To repeat over and over again with a terrible urgency. The ironic story of a retribution that destroyed him and everything he possessed. The story of a nameless terror from which there was no escape. For no one can escape the swift, clinging tendrils of a mad obsession. Yes. Yes, I want you to hear my story. I've told it several times now. I, I believe I can repeat it and without leaving out any details. I know I won't omit Claire. She meant so much to me so very much. Why, it seems only yesterday that she came walking down the corridor at the investment company and into my office. Claire! Oh, hello, Norton, dear. Hope you don't mind my walking in on you. Well, you know I don't. Busy? The president of an investment firm is never busy. With a big company behind him, he can well afford to hire good assistants to do all the work. Well, you've certainly hired all the experts on Wall Street, then. What do you mean? Just that I've read the semi-annual report of Worthington and Company. There seems to be no end to the amount of money you... Or rather, your hired assistants are earning for the firm. That's our job. But it's not your job to kill yourself working so hard. It's not that bad, Claire. Yes, it is, Norton, and you know it. This job killed my father, and I don't want the same thing to happen to you. What would you suggest? Why don't you retire? You mean you want someone else in this position? It's not that I have anybody in mind, Norton. It's just that I think you've worked too hard all your life, and... You're entitled to arrest. At my age, Claire, I'm only 35. Of course, to a 26-year-old girl, that must sound quite elderly. That's not what I meant, Norton. Then what are you driving at? I'd like to sell out. Sell out? That's right. My father's been dead exactly one year. You've already increased the $7 million he left to me to more than 10. Is that bad? That's just it. It's good. I've got more money than I'll ever need. And you, you're a millionaire in your own right. 
It isn't the money, Claire. A man has to have something to do. Then you insist on working? Call it that. All right, then. Sign these papers. What's this? New incorporation papers. You know, I thought you'd be stubborn and not want to retire, so I had these drawn up. Just put your name on the dotted line, and then the firm of Worthington and Company becomes Worthington and Roberts. Oh. But, Claire... No I... buts about it, Norton. As long as you're going to run this business, then by everything that's right, you should be a full-fledged partner. <laughs> Not just a figurehead of one of the oldest investment houses in America, but an active partner. That meant I had prestige, power, everything. That is, nearly everything I wanted. That night, celebrating the merger of Worthington and Roberts, Claire joined me at my penthouse. After dinner, we stood on the terrace looking out over the city. I never knew that... that New York could be so... <laughs> well, finish it. So empty... Oh, Norton, you're teasing. Look at the city. The lights, the people, the traffic. It's anything but empty. You're wrong, Claire. Look at me. You call your life empty? Yes, dear. Without anyone to share it. Without you to share it. But, Norton... And Claire, you must have known. Yes, I've known. For a very long time. But... But What? I feel so differently toward you, like like a brother. Is that why you were so interested in my welfare? Oh, it's more than that, Norton. I wish I could explain my feelings. Is there someone else? Oh, I see. I should have known. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you, not for the world. But for the longest time, I didn't know which one I loved most. Then that makes our merger purely a business one. Yes, Norton, I'm afraid so. When it comes to the heart, you are second choice. Second choice. Norton Roberts, the most eligible bachelor in New York. Second choice with the one girl he wanted. Suddenly the thought struck me. Who was first choice? I... I couldn't help thinking, what if such a person had never come into Claire's life... What if such a person didn't exist? Yes? Hello, Claire? Oh, hello, Norton. I called you to say goodbye. Goodbye? I'm going on a vacation. Oh. Well, it was your idea. You said I was working too hard. Well, where are you going? Hunting in Montana for one whole month. Will you write? <laughs> Not a chance. I'm going off with a guide away from civilization. But how can I get in touch with you if anything important comes up? Oh, don't worry. Nothing will come up. I've attended to everything. Change will do me good. But, Norton, want I see you tomorrow? I'm afraid not, Claire. I'm leaving tonight. Yes. I was going hunting, all right. But not for mountain lions or bears or coyotes. I was going hunting for a man. Murder was my game. Just as I'd hired men to do my other work, I planned to hire someone to commit that murder for me. Three days later in San Francisco, I learned that the man I wanted to see was Victor Corrin. Come in. Are you Victor Corrin? Who are you? My name is uh, Walter Bradshaw. That's not your name. But never mind about that. What do you want? I want you to murder a man. Yeah? Look. This is a legitimate business deal. My assets happen to be cash. Yours happen to be, shall we say, brawn. Who sent you here? Nobody. I've been around. I know you're a front man to break up strikes, start riots, to do anything for whichever side pays you most. You know a lot for a stranger. I know the stakes are high. And I'm willing to pay $15,000 for a man's life. Who's the man? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, mister. I don't know what your game now, is. Now, wait a minute. Let me explain. Somebody is going to marry Claire Worthington and... You mean the heir to the late King of Wall Street? That's the girl. I want you to kill the man who marries her. And you don't know who he is? No. But no matter who he is, kill him. Why do you want him murdered? You'll be well paid for eliminating the man, not for knowing the reasons why. Is it a deal? Well, how am I to know... It'll be in all the newspapers when she gets married. 
The method of murder and the time, I'll leave to your discretion. Well? It'll cost you another 15 grand. 15,000 more? That's what I said. This 15 is my share for giving the orders. The others will be for the killer. I see. And who will that be? That'll be my business. Yes. Yes, of course. Suppose I pay you, say, after the murder has taken place? In this line, we always get paid in advance. Especially when we deal with guys like you who hide their identity. But I don't have that kind of money with me. Well, then get it. <laughs> Very well. Here you are. Well, had it all along. <laughs> Smart business. Man. I've been called that. Anyway, there you are. Another 15,000, five tens and twenties. Yeah, good enough. Okay, mister. It's a deal. How will I know that... That I've carried out my part? You'll read it in the papers after Claire Worthington gets hitched. Unless you want a written receipt for one murder paid in full. That night I was on the train... Before we got to Chicago, I, I knew that if Victor Corrin sent one of his thugs to trail me for a bit of blackmail, I'd successfully eluded him. Not too long afterwards, I was safely back in New York. I went to Claire's apartment. Norton. Of all people, Norton Roberts. Claire, dear, remember me? Oh, a sight for lonesome eyes. When did you get back? This minute. Haven't even been home. Oh, it was sweet of you to come here first. Well, come on in. I was just going to have some coffee. Now, sit down. Tell me all about your trip. Well, it was very dull. Slept, ate, walked. Catch anything? No. Set a few traps. That was about all. Oh, you're too chicken-hearted to kill a rabbit. You can't fool me. It was a good change of scene, anyway. You know, I'm glad you went away, Norton. It was your suggestion. No, I didn't mean that. I'm glad you went away because it made me realize how much I depend on oh, you. Oh, don't be silly, Claire. Anybody could carry on the business. I'm not talking about the business. I'm talking about me. Claire. It's the truth, Norton. I knew after you left how much you meant to me and how much I loved you. But, but this other fellow, the one who was first choice. There never was another fellow. I just had to be sure, that's all. Your first choice, Norton, if you still want me. Well, darling, of course I want you more than anything or anyone in the world. Well, then let's not wait. <laughs> dear, we can't jump into this. Well, why not? Are you trying to stall oh, me? Oh, don't talk that way, Claire. You know I want to marry you, only... Only right now... Oh, what can possibly stand I, in our way? I, I've, I've got to go to San Francisco on business. Well, is it so important that it can't wait until we get married? Yes, yes, it's very important it can't wait. I've got to dash off to San Francisco. I'll fly there tomorrow morning. We go together, Norton. No, no, we can't do that. I... Darling, you can't put me off. What do you say? Do we get married in the morning and go to San Francisco together, or...? Very well, Claire. We'll get married in the morning. Afraid, Norton Roberts? The man Claire marries is to be murdered. Remember? Murdered for a price. The price you paid. And tomorrow, the headlines in San Francisco will put the finger on the man you wanted dead. Think fast, Norton Roberts, and outwit, if you can, the clever scheming of your own obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story.
fateful twist in the life of Norton Roberts and his now imperative obsession to change the outcome of our story, starring Philip Terry. It is the rightful privilege of a woman to change her mind, but in so doing, she oft-times causes the undoing of the best-laid skeins of plans and schemes, and sometimes the undoing of the schemer himself. It was a grim bargain Norton Roberts made, a bargain with death himself. And in his mind, the panic grows and builds, becomes insurmountable. He must live, he must escape. Life, his life, must be bought back at any price. Living now is his only obsession. Yes, my bargain in murder had taken an ironic twist. You see, I arranged for the murder of the man who was going to marry Claire Worthington, never dreaming that Claire would change her mind at the last minute and, and marry me. Now, combining a honeymoon with what Claire thought was business, I had to hurry back to San Francisco to try to change the pattern of my design for murder. It, it wasn't easy making explanations to Claire when I dropped her at the hotel, but I managed it, and then I told the cab driver to take me to a waterfront address. That's it, over there, driver, on the other side of the street. Uh, this the place, mister? Across the street, I said. Well, if you take my advice, you'll stay away from that joint. It's being watched. By whom? With the cops. They're hot after the killer. Somebody murdered? Somebody murdered, he asked me. Victor Corrin was bumped off this morning. Victor? Corrin? Yeah, and they got away with $15,000 that he was carrying. Do they know who did it? Yeah, the cops don't, but the grapevine has it that it was one of his own men pulling a double cross. You better stay clear of that joint, sir. There may be fireworks. Uh, back to the hotel? Yes. So Victor Corrin was dead. And since he had only $15,000, that meant he had already paid off the murderer. The murderer who was after me. Somebody was going to kill me. Somebody, it could be anybody, like the taxi. Yes. Yes, it could be the taxi driver. Why are you stopping here? The traffic light. In San Francisco, the red light means stop. Oh. Uh, boy, oh. Uh, give me a morning paper. Yeah, thanks. That taxi driver. He knew too much about Corrin and the money. He, he didn't want me to go up there. How do I know Victor Corrin was murdered? How do I know that the taxi driver wasn't plotting against me? I watched him closely, and then I noticed through the rearview mirror that he was looking at me. But I was ready for him. Yes, I was ready when he suddenly half turned and said, Say, you're Norton Roberts, aren't you? No, no! Hey, 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 look out! Don't, don't jump! Don't! How do you feel now, Norton? Fine. That, that taxi driver, he tried to kill me. Oh, that's nonsense. Then what am I doing in this hospital? Darling, you were hit by an automobile. I was. Not hard, thank goodness. The car's crashed to save you. Let's get out of here. Well, it'll be a day or two before you get over your shock. Then you'll be perfectly all right to attend to your business. I've finished with my business. Let's go back to New York. All right, Norton. We'll go back to New York tomorrow or the day after. Who's that? Well, take it easy, darling. It's probably the doctor or a nurse. I'll see. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Oh, hello, driver. Won't, won't you come in? Uh, thanks. Uh, how do you feel this morning, Mr. Roberts? How did you know I was Norton Roberts? Well, your picture. It was in the front page of the morning paper. Oh. Oh, I was afraid of that. And then next time somebody recognizes you, you don't have to jump. Yeah, especially out of moving taxis. It's bad business. Is your car wrecked? Yes, ma'am. The other driver really smacked it up trying to keep from running over Mr. Roberts. Well, we'll handle the expenses, of course. You don't have to worry. Oh, gee, th thank you, ma'am. You can drive me to the hotel and I'll give you a check. Darling, now you just rest comfortably and I'll be right back. Oh, you can't leave me here alone. 
The hospital is well staffed with doctors and nurses. Where are you going? To arrange for a trip back to New York. Claire. What is it? Will you... Will you charter a private plane for just the two of us? Yes, Norton. I'll charter a private plane. <laughs> I didn't trust anyone. Before we left San Francisco, I made them change the pilots. For all I knew, one of the pilots might have been my killer. The only thing I was sure of was that somebody was going to murder me, and I had to get to him before he got to me. Cleo, why do you look at me like that? I was just thinking... Thinking what? How much you've changed since you went hunting that day. Nonsense. It's excitement coming back, getting married, flying across the country. man doesn't do that every day, you know. I should hope not. Now... Don't you worry about me. As soon as we get back to New York, I'll... I'll be myself again. Norton, I want you to do me a favor. Anything. I want you to see Dr. Armstrong. What for? Your nerves. There's nothing wrong with my nerves, nothing. You're as jittery as... I'm not as... jittery. Yes, you are. Besides, you promised me you'd do whatever I asked. For heaven's sake, Claire, don't treat me like a child. Well, I'm only thinking of you, dear. It's up to a wife to make her husband happy, you know. That was a fine one. She... She only wanted to make her husband happy. <laughs> if I hadn't married her, I'd have been all right. Perfectly all right. What is it? Mrs. Roberts? Yes? I am Sperber, the new butler, ma'am. Oh, yes. Uh, come in. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Come along with me. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, can you cook by any chance? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, but I don't as a rule, ma'am. Well, uh, I met just for tonight. You see, we're hiring an entire new household staff, and the others won't be here until tomorrow. I, I understand, ma'am. There'll be just the two of us, Mr. Roberts and myself, for dinner. Um, think you can find everything? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just leave everything to me. You're not eating very much, Norton. I'm not hungry. There must be something troubling Nothing's you. troubling me. Who's the new butler? His name is Spurgeon. Yes, I know, but where does he come from? Santa Barbara, I think. The West Coast? Well, what's so terrible about that? How can you let a strange man in the house without even knowing one little thing about him? Well, darling, he had references. They checked on him at the agency where I always get my servants. Oh, shh. Here he comes. The soup was very good, Sperber. Oh, uh, thank you, ma'am. What's that? This, sir. Why, it's meatloaf, sir. What's in it? Ground sirloin, breadcrumbs, onions, tomato sauce. What else? Well, just salt and pepper, and sir. Poison? Norton. I, I don't understand, it's sir. Very simple. I ask you a question. Is there any poison in that meatloaf? No, sir. Of course there isn't. Then eat some of it. Well, uh, begging your pardon, sir, I've already had my dinner. Well, you see, you're afraid to taste it. Then it is poison. Oh, Norton, Norton, please. Answer me. It is poison, isn't it? wrong about that butler. But I couldn't take any chances, not with him or any of the other servants. It was the same way at the office. When my secretary left me, I interviewed a dozen girls before I hired one I could trust. Because my killer could be a woman. That, that's the way it was with me for days, weeks, months. I didn't know what to do until... until I saw him... A man trailing me. In the morning, when I got into my limousine, he was lounging nonchalantly across the street. If I looked out of my office window, I could see him down by the main entrance. The killer had found me at last. Someday, very soon, he would strike. I had to get away anywhere. I took all the cash I could find in the safe, walked out of the office in the middle of the day. I went down the back stairs, didn't use the elevator, came out on the street at the rear of the building, and there I yelled for a cab. Taxi! Taxi! Look, I want you to take me to... Oh, you have a passenger. It's okay. I don't mind sharing the cab. Get in. No. 
No, I know who you are. Get in. I'll drop you off. Where do you want to go? The, the, to Wall Street. But you just came from there. How do you know? I know a lot about you, Mr. Roberts. Then, then you know that I'm married to Claire Worthington. I should. Look, I'll, I'll give you money. 50000 a 100000 Here I have a lot of cash. There's more. If you leave me alone. But, Mr. Roberts, I'm not trying to do... Leave me alone, do you hear? Leave me alone. Mr. Roberts. Leave me you. alone. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Thank you very much for your services. I'll have the check sent to your office. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Roberts. Oh, uh, that's the Coronet Detective Agency. Yes. Will you need any further reports? No. The doctors say there isn't any doubt that my husband's insane. I... I guess not. Does he still keep telling that ridiculous story? Oh, to everyone who will listen. He just finished telling it to his nurse again. The, uh, the poor devil. Yes. It makes it doubly hard because Norton was such a good man. <laughs> Such a good man, Claire? Perhaps. But the punishment fits the crime as it always must. The escape was made, but into a shadowy realm from which there is no further escape. A realm created from his own device, the tortured labyrinth of a mad obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. Next week, we'll tell you the story of a man whose life meant less to him than his house. A man with an obsession so overpowering that he was willing to murder his best friend. Drive the woman he professed to love insane rather than lose a monument he had built to himself. You will live every moment of next week's story as you follow John Loder in the role of Norman Marshall through the twisting, devious pathways of a homicidal maze when you listen to... Obsession. Tonight's story, starring Philip Terry was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood.